ಕರುಣಾರ್ಣವಮಾಯ್ ಕರುದಗ್ಗತಿ ನಲ್ಗು ಅರುಣಾಚಲ ಶಿವ ಬುದ್ಧಿಯಹಂಕಾರ ಪುಲಂಬೇದವೂಂಗು ಮದ್ದೀದಯ ತಾನ್ ಮರೆಯವನು ಮಾಲು ನಮಸ್ತೆ ರಿಚರ್ಡ್ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಆದ್ಯ ಶಾಂತಿ ಓಂ ಅರುಣಾಚಲ So wow what a week it's been whoa Well uh I have enjoyed watching your week because uh it's rare that you see someone going through the kind of transitions that you're going through Oh and, man they're big ones and uh it shows again that uh change comes about from knowledge yes yes and my the story i want to tell you really illustrates that okay so well I, yeah the, this last week uh you and i have been working on guru vachika kovai and uh, the first chapter where ramana talks about how it's not necessary to pursue religious rituals and yogas and bhakti or even bhakti on the direct path so being the kind of guy i am i was looking for some scriptural confirmation of this mhm and oh boy i fell down a rabbit hole <laughs> a mile deep and uh found some very interesting shastras that confirm these views mhm and also uh give some very good methods by which people can implement ramana's process yes you know it's it's uh, very difficult to just sit down and stop the mind yes practically impossible yes um but one thing everybody has to do is breathe so the buddha taught anapanasati which means mindfulness of breathing mm mm-hmm. and in the shiva tantras actually the the, the kaula tantras so they're, they're unique to shri vidya i found a description of the mantra so hum which means the same thing as aham brahmasmi mhm or tat tvam masi uh, that uh, you are the brahman <laughs> I yes. am Brahman. Yes. So hum. So hum. Saha. Yeah, saha means that and aham means I am. So I am that. Yes. So you mentally watch the breath and repeat saha on the in breath and hum on the out breath. And uh I was doing that today. I got in so much ecstasy. I could hardly see straight. I mean, wow. <laughs> Drugs are nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm going to be working up a presentation on this tantra. Uh, I'm going to keep it until I have it more developed maybe yes. by next week. Yes. But basically that's what's been happening. Well, that's pretty uh deep more than what you have said here has been happening 
as I observe you and uh, how you seem to be thinking about this because I have also heard you basically say it's time for a different way to be able to approach this and to do it in a way that is uncompromising like the examples we have from Ramana. And I uh, haven't looked up whether Ramana taught this so hung breath. I haven't seen that. I don't recall that from any of the things that I have seen. I do know he did say one thing that uh, you are experiencing as uh, significant, and he said uh, often, I have no Sankalpa. Hmm. And uh, I believe that you have had some direct, immediate experience with uh, desires and having no desires. Yeah, I didn't talk about it last week because I wanted to give it some more time, but it's, it's, it's real. <laughs> I woke up in the middle of the night, as I often do, about 2 o'clock, 2.30, having a kind of disturbing dream, emotionally intense dream. Somebody was manipulating me. And I saw very clearly the only way they could manipulate me is because I had desires. Yes, yes. So I said, well, then, what if I don't have desires? <laughs> what if I let go of all desires? What a question. <laughs> and at that moment, in the deep of the night, when everything is completely silent, I got the blessing of actually being without desires. And it was so beautiful. I felt so happy, more happy than I've ever felt, I think, in my memory of my life. And at the same time, I felt completely free. Like I didn't have to do anything or be anybody or have any particular thoughts. The mind stopped on its own. So lately, the last two weeks or so, I've been practicing this and looking for a, a method where I could practice it without going into deep meditation, you know, <laughs> like wild walking or right. working or doing other things. Yes. Riding in the car or whatever. And this so hum method just I mean, dropped out of the sky on me. One of our viewers named Ido published a comment where he asked about it. And so, of course, I had to go look it up, right? <laughs> Down the rabbit hole. <laughs> and uh, that's where I've been all day. That's uh, wonderful. And uh, if it is real, then it has to be something that is with you always. And right. uh, you are uh, trying to figure out how to let that door open. I say it that way because we know that the ego doesn't open the door. No we, kind of doing. Yes, no kind of doing is going to open any door that matters. No. And so you're trying to figure out the way I say it is to uh, let the mind get just get out of the way so you can do have your life. My happy life. 
your happy life, your real life, your life without being encumbered by all the myriads of things we carry around within our silly head. It was Vasana. That's right. Well, we thought it was a good next, idea at the time. <laughs> next to next to consciousness, the only thing that doesn't change very much anyway, as long as the body is alive, is breathing. Yes, yes. You're breathing in all three states of consciousness, waking, yes. dreaming, yes. and deep sleep. Yes. And if you try to control it, you try to stop it, for example, you find out you can't. That's right. So I think this breathing method has got great potential. At least today, I mean, I got so high off of it, and it's just ridiculous. <laughs> now, the other thing that uh, doesn't change is existence. Yes, but that's much deeper. You have to go into Nirvikalpa Samadhi to, to taste that. But still, this existence is always there and always the same, and uh, that gives me enormous peace. You know, you can touch it. You just, it's another one of those things. I, for me, that you, I just have to remember to notice. It's always there. Mm -hmm. No special yeah. method is required. No, no. And importantly, no effort. Yes. The Let's opposite of effort is required. It's not just no effort. It's the in kind of entire lack of effort. Relinquishing effort, yeah. Yes. Yes. And for folks like me who love being pretending to be the doer, this uh, no effort is sometimes harder than any doing. Indeed. That's why I think a good approach to it, a gradual approach through the breathing. Mm -hmm. Whether just by noticing the breathing, anapanasati, mindfulness yes. of breathing, or yes. through this most simple mantra, so hum. Oh, yes, I haven't tried the so hum. Uh, when I first started to do inquiry, I would sit down for 20 minutes of inquiry. And the way it would go is for 18 minutes, I watch my breath, and finally uh, my mind settled down enough that I could uh, ask who I am I, and uh, you know, kind of see into the open space. So my 20 minutes of inquiry was to begin with 18 minutes of watching my breath, <laughs> you know, to get ready for a moment of inquiry. That makes sense. And, well, you know, I was hours. able to do that practice for about two hours today. Uh huh. Wow. Yeah, it was really easy. Even I could chant my Sri Vidya mantra and so hung at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like the, the Sri Vidya mantra, the uh, Mahasodashi mantra, feels like it's in the, in the heart and throat, you know, by the Vishnu Granti. Mm -hmm. And, but the so hung mantra seems to be in the third eye. Okay, okay. So and they it's... can both go on simultaneously. Okay. <laughs> and the Soham Matra ascends in the chakras. Oh boy, does it ever. We'll get into all that when I get to the Tantra that describes it. And um, it, dis it goes into great detail on that. Okay. 
Now, we had prepared for today a few slides. Yeah. Shall I start the slideshow? Yes, please. Okay. Here we go. And we're starting with verse 8, and we'll just do a few verses from this text. A few key verses. Verse 8. The benefit of this light of supreme truth is the understanding that there is not the least thing such as attainment. Since the Supreme Self is the ever-attained one whole, thus the mental wanderings caused by striving towards Dharma, Artha, and Kama are also removed. And it seems like that has been your own experience this week. Yes, right. Um, also, Ramana Maharshi used to uh, say this directly to people, that the self is already attained. It's already realized. And as we discussed in a recent video, who becomes enlightened? Uh, there's nobody to attain. Who is, who is going to be there when enlightenment happens? Nobody. So all of this striving for nobody, it's funny. Uh, well, if self is already attained, then all we have to do is recognize it. Yes, yes. Just like Turiya, Turiya is always there as the root of the other three states of consciousness. But we're normally completely unaware of it because we don't recognize it. Yes. So my work in particular has been to educate people in these concepts <coughs> regarding consciousness that um, without Turiya, the pure awareness, the other three states of consciousness wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. But the difference is, in the other three states, the objects are the body, the mind, and the world. Whereas in Turiya, the objects are the other states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it's, I guess, for most people, a very subtle distinction, mm -hmm. but it's profound. So then the Ramana's point in this verse is, why should we strive for religious merit, dharma, or wealth, artha, or sense enjoyment, kama? If all these things are coming anyway, according to our karma, and really nothing we do in this life is going to change the uh, pattern of the karma that's already ripened, uh, the only thing we can do is store up karma for the next life. <laughs> or not. So why should we, yeah, why should we do that? Why don't we just, uh, like Ramana makes the example, if you're riding in a train and you have some luggage, you don't keep the luggage on your back. You put it on the luggage rack and let the train carry. So in the same way, we put our karma on Shiva, on Arunachala. Let Arunachala carry all that. We don't have to worry about it or do anything about it. Just let it happen and watch. And I think more release it. 
Well, yes. If, if you don't pursue or become attached to the karma, it'll release on its own. Mm -hmm. It's this ego attachment that this right. is my karma, yes. my body, my work. Yes. <laughs> so by letting go of the ego, by letting go of desire, especially, um, we save ourselves so much trouble. That's right, and no ego certainly means no desire because all of the desires are to feed the ego and they're based on the uh, erroneous idea that somehow you are a limited individual so you need more to make you happy. Well, let's just look at Dharma, for example. People identify with a particular faith Yes. or yogic process or whatever. And they make that their identity. You know, what, what's your religion? Oh, I'm a Hindu or I'm a Buddhist or I'm a this or a that. And then, of course, the other guys, the other religions are all wrong. Only mine is good. <laughs> So this gives us so much difficulty in life. Then we have to dislike or even hate people in other religions. And then we have to form all kinds of complicated relationships with the people in our religion. It's exhausting. Yes. No wonder the... Uh... Folks like Buddha you just go out in the woods and sit under a tree. Yeah, that's the good life, huh? Yes. Uh, if you have the strength to do nothing. It's funny that uh, I have to say it that way. Oh, it's a good way to put it. Because it takes a certain mental strength. Not necessarily an effort, exactly. Right, right. But simply holding a certain space. But after a while, this holding the space becomes just what is normal. Effortless, yeah. Yes, effortless. And the real effortless, uh, not... Uh, it's funny about this effortlessness. Uh, while I was in Terra Anomaly, a neighbor of mine uh, wrote a book, Effortless Meditation. And what is funny about it is before he wrote this book, he spent 10 years meditating all day, every day. And... So at the end of that, he could tell us uh, how it is effortless. Well, maybe if you develop a habit that long and you don't think about it anymore. Uh-huh. But it does seem like a lot of work. <laughs> That's right. That's right. He smiled, though, when I saw him. So it's, it's good for him. Yes, it was right? good for him. And he got uh, to that, write a book. <laughs> at that stage, you know, the stage of the Vartavada, that effort may be necessary. Uh huh. But at least it's not the kind of effort uh, like in bhakti where you, you get so emotional, you know? Yes, yes. Or in karma yoga where there's so much work involved. It's a kind of effort of actually stopping all that. Yes, yes. Now, Sadhu Om said about this verse, up until now the Shastras have prescribed as the rightful goals of human life the following four aims. Dharma, the practice of righteous social duties. Artha, the acquisition of wealth through righteous means. Kama, the satisfaction of desires within righteous limits, and moksha, liberation, the natural state, 
of abiding as the self. Then he goes on to say, this work shows us now that the first three worldly aims are futile and transitory, and thus it removes our wandering mental efforts to attain them. We may, however, still think, is not mental effort at least needed to attain moksha? But again, this light shows us the meaninglessness of striving to attain self, which is ever attained, and instead it recommends the cessation of all mental activity, thereby fixing us on the eternal, motionless, and the ever attained state of self. It is therefore is there therefore any supreme goal other than that which is given here through this light through this light of supreme truth and then it refers to verse 12 something that we'll talk about in a few minutes yeah i think we already discussed this pretty well why yes, don't we, we did. go on to verse 9 yes. Yes. Self, which is one's own true nature, is the substratum of all happiness in this and in other worlds. Therefore, to be firmly established in self, unshaken by thoughts concerning the various other paths that lead only to the pleasures of this and other worlds is the fruit of this work. Maybe we should read the commentary too? Yes. Now, uh, Oops. <laughs> first you had uh, inserted a slide about the Yoga Sutras saying he's explaining yoga, and yoga is restraining the chitta, the consciousness, from taking various forms, vrittis. Isn't that the same process as Ramana is teaching? Sure sounds like it. Yeah, to restrain the mind from changing forms and qualities and going here and there and doing this and that. Yes. That's yoga. Yes. So that is also uh, one of the side effects of bhajana. Mm -hmm. The mind is automatically restrained if it's fixed on the self. Yes. And we don't have to do anything about it. No. <laughs> In fact, we have to let go of striving for all these other aims, like dharma, artha, kama. You mean I have to let go of all my doing? Oh, no. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to let it go anyway when the body I dies. I know, but now... Anyway, excuse me, I'm just pretending to whine. Yeah. It's actually very pleasant. Yes. I think that may be why they talk about it as bliss. Yeah, that fits. <laughs> I was certainly blissed out today. I thought I was going to levitate. I was so blissed out. <laughs> but the process really isn't work at all. Because, you know, you're already breathing. So just watch the breath, and eventually the mind becomes calm enough to right. attain desirelessness. If you're not running after dharma, artha, and kama, then what desires are left? Only the desire for moksha. Yes. And even that has to be given up eventually. Yes. But, of course, when you feeling so much happiness, it's pretty easy to drop it. So... <laughs> oh, um. So, um... Let me go to the next slide. 
This is verse 1203. The reality, which is very clearly known by sages as the goal of all Vedas and Agamas, is the observance of reality recommended by all Dharma Upadesas is nothing but silence, the state of supreme peace. I think there's a comment by Sadhu Om. Okay. Ah, yes, Thank there you. is. The true Purusartha, or goal of human life, is the peaceful state of liberation which can be attained only when one completely gives up the desire for the other three so-called purusarthas, namely dharma, artha, and kama. Therefore, one should give up even the thought of those other three purusarthas and should steadfastly abide in silence the supreme state of self-knowledge, which alone is liberation. Hmm. I remember when I first read that, and it seemed very intimidating. You know, silence seems yes. like such a heavy word, you know. But when the, but silence is really just the, the other side of the coin of bliss. Mm -hmm. Because when you're so happy, you don't want anything. Yes. You know, and certainly to be a big famous religionist or a very wealthy person or, you know, famous, beautiful powerful, knowledgeable, renounced, or, you know, whatever arthas, commas, there are. To be able to let go of that is so rare. Mm -hmm. You know, even for someone on the path of realization. Yes. And we see it all the time. At least I, was, I would see it all the time in Tiruvannamala. That people would come... And they would, you know, visit the ashram and, and sit and do the meditation. And then they would walk out the front and go out drinking or partying. You know, like they were on holiday. Well, I guess they were on holiday. Yes, they were on holiday. And they were also trying, once they went out to the gate, to see if there was some other person with whom they could hook up. Yeah, and you know, I withdrew from that whole scene because of that, and I just went into sort of seclusion right. in my house, and it did me so much good. At first it was hard, you know, because I had all the urges you know, to go out and yes. make friends and this and that, socialize and blah, blah, blah. But after some time, there was a certain kind of sweetness to not having to deal with all of that. Yes. That's it was why very I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Refreshing. No, it was problem. It was yeah, just refreshing, you know. Yes. Uh, that's why in my years in Taravanamali, though I went to the ashram, uh, I my life was outside the ashram, and I spent more time uh, with Aranachala than I did with anything else. And it was quiet and peaceful. I would go out in the morning. I had uh, two of the Indian dogs that would go out with me, and we got to know... Uh, the mountain so well. Besides the inner path, there are these network of other paths. And what I've always thought about paths is they go somewhere. And to find out where they go, you just have to go look. And there must be something interesting at the end of this path. That's right. And I found many wonderful places to just sit and be 
with the mountain doing that, and my dogs were happy because they were out in the forest. So what more could I want? Yeah, that's the best part of our naturalism. Unfortunately, it's all off limits now. Uh huh. Yes, it except is all. The, except the path to uh, Skandashrama. Uh huh. Now, don't tell anybody, but there's a secret, which is it's all off limits. But uh, the forest guards, before they go out there, and see if any strangers are there. Uh, these are Tamils, and they have to eat breakfast. Oh. So uh, what I found is going early. Uh, I spent years of going early while it was still closed and off limits and never saw anyone except an ah. occasional sadhu sitting under the tree meditating. So it's all in the timing. Uh, it seemed to be. Yeah. And of course, some people are uncool. They blow their cover by bragging about it publicly, you know. Yes, um, of course. Not a good idea. No, so anyway, it... just being there, just being near the hill is enough. You know, you get the energy, yes. the influence of our natural. Yes. Well, I would say just being. You don't need to add the near the hill. Just being, you get the energy of Aranachala. Yes, but to be physically close to the hill at first... Right. Helps you tune into that level of yes. being. That's right. Well, the, again, this silly mind wants to externalize all of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so having the mountain that we love near us helps. You know, that's my yeah. backdrop today. It reminds me of when I was living there and I would look up and see this exact view. Like, you know, he's he's always looking over and caring for us, you know, yes. making sure that we're aligned with the highest purpose like that. That's the advantage of living in a holy place. Yes, yes. It's just easier. Yeah, for the beginners. Yes. But now I found I can go anywhere and still retain the awareness. Yes. After five years of being there, and then very intensively, you know, being alone and most of the time like that. Now I don't feel any separation. I used to. Mm -hmm. I can remember going out of our Arunachala and after 24 kilometers or whatever it is, feeling a real drop off in the energy. Mm -hmm and uh, coming back the opposite. And now it's like he's there everywhere. Yes. Of course, uh, Aeronatula is being, Aeronatula is consciousness, and uh, conveniently that is wherever we are is that being and consciousness, of course. Again, that's one of the reasons why it seems so silly that you have to work to notice what is always there. Well, at first you do, yeah. Yes, yes. Once you're tuned in, though. It's always it does, there. Yeah. That's funny about what is always is what is always is always. But we think... That's, or we take that for granted. Yes. And we try to use it to gain our desires and stuff. You know, that's the problem. And, and in the process, we actually, we, we insult Shiva, you know, because we're using his energy for our purposes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very selfish of us. 
at least we could, you know, the, the principle of bhakti, and to a certain extent karma yoga, is to use God's energy for God's purposes. Yes. Which is a step in the right direction. But the culmination of all that really is the attainment of oneness and silence. Yes. That happiness is forever. Yes. Unconditioned, that, unchanging. And uh, that is why Ramana always said his primary teaching was silence. Uh, like uh, Dakshina Murti. Yes. Exactly like Dakshina Murti. His ashram is even situated on the southern side of the mountain. Yes, yes. Which is the meaning of Dakshina. Yes. So, well, I was going to say something, but I believe I'm going to leave it until next week after I've done a little more work on the tantras. Okay, very good. And I appreciate that uh, before you are saying these things, you give yourself a chance to have the experience ripen and come to fullness. Yeah, I still get impatient. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. I know about some of these things. Uh, they, When you feel this bliss, there is uh, this urge to stand up on top of your house and uh, say it to the world. I was certainly feeling like that today. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's continue with uh, our text, and so you can show us this in your comments. So then the final verse is this 1204, the complete giving up of all beginning with dharma is the glorious state of peace, which is the nature of liberation, completely giving up all thought of the others, cling only to silence, the knowledge of the Supreme Self, which is Shiva. Sadhu Aum says, the true Purusartha, or goal of human life, is the peaceful state of liberation, which can be attained only when one completely gives up the desire for the other three so-called Purusarthas, namely Dharma, Artha, and Kama. Therefore, one should give up even the thought of those other three Purusarthas and should steadfastly abide in silence, the supreme state of self-knowledge, which alone is liberation. Yeah, Purusha means a person, a human being, and Artha is wealth or gain. Okay. So human concept of gain or wealth, the acquisition of assets, as the Buddha calls it, is these, it falls into these three categories. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole point is that one becomes attached to them and makes all kinds of efforts because of them, takes so many pains and so much trouble because of them, and that all of this is ultimately useless because when the body passes away, it's all finished. Good point. Yeah. Why should we bother so much to attain something we know is going to pass away? Yes. It's like the people who spend hours at the gym, you know? Don't you realize that's all going to turn to flab when you're 60 and you're going to have to get heart surgery because of all the drugs you're taking? <laughs> it's steroids and stuff. 
It happened to Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mm -hmm. He had quadruple bypass surgery at age 65. I mean, you really want to go there just to have a nice looking body for a few years mm -hmm. after and so much effort and pain, you know, ah, and then there's the people who run after money or fame or any of the opulences. Mm -hmm. They take so much time and trouble. And what it ultimately comes down to is that they don't have time for self-realization. Yes. So they get to the end of life and then they're lamenting. If they're yes. even intelligent enough to recognize that they're missing. Yes. Huh? Uh, I was from Silicon Valley, and in Silicon Valley, there are this uh, set of uh, kind of wealthy technologists who had some idea and turned it into a company and grew the company and made lots of money and fame and all of these things. And I knew some of these. and. Of the ones I knew, I didn't know any of them that were happy. And uh, they were ones that, by the rules of the American culture, they had everything. And everything wasn't enough. It's never enough. Plus, it's all temporary. That's right. So I wonder what it's like uh, have this for this person who has everyone, but who still dies. I wonder what they think in these last moments. Oh my! God. I don't. I wouldn't want to be there. You know. There's a beautiful Bengali song. Durlabhamanava Janma. It starts out like that. And it basically means, I attain this human life, which is very difficult and rare to obtain. But I wasted it in pursuit of material goals. And now at the end of my life, I'm lamenting why I didn't pursue the service of the Atma. I'm going to record this song. I really like this song. Oh, I think it's worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah, when I get a little time. <laughs> and it's good, to, it's good to hear it now so you don't have to think it later. Right. <laughs> that's know. the lesson. Yeah, that's the lesson of it all. Yes. Durlabhamana Vajanma, this rare, difficult human birth. The Shastra explains, if you have the ocean of open sea, right? And you have a, a board, an old piece of board or, or a tree trunk or something floating in the ocean, driftwood. And in this driftwood, there's a little hole, right? And on the bottom of the ocean, there's a tortoise. You know, tortoises can go in the water and sleep for many years. Okay. So this tortoise comes up like once every century to breathe. So what are the odds when this old tortoise comes up for a breath? He's going to put his head right through that hole in that driftwood. What are the odds? Right? Astronomically. That's the chances of getting a human birth. Okay. Because there's 8,400,000 species, according to Vedas. And only like 10 of them are human on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And all the rest are like animals, plants, mm -hmm. down to even little worms and stuff. Like uh -huh. that. And of course, there are billions and billions of those for every human being. Yes. So what are the chances? If we, if we waste this valuable, rare opportunity of human life, how long is it going to be before we get another opportunity like this? 
Yes. So we should use the present that we are given, the gift from the universe that we have been given, and not waste that opportunity. Every moment is precious. Yes, every moment. And we forget. We forget this moment looks kind of like the last moment, and we forget how special it is. What a bad habit. It's terrible. And we are uh, indoctrinated and supported in that bad habit by all these enablers. Yes, yes, Parents yes. and school and business and society and TV and entertainment and, you know, so many other things. Now, Marugunar showed in this, uh, the work that was behind Guru Vachala Kolai, uh, the other approach to waste rather than waste the time he spent 30 years with Ramana and this Ooh. book was collected over those 30 years of listening to Ramana's fairly rare statements and then recording those statements and checking with Ramana to make sure that he had it right and so he spent 30 years being able to uh, have the wonderful duty, if you will, of recording what Ramana said. And I'm so grateful that this work exists. I've heard that there are, besides the 1200 verses, there were another thousand verses that somehow were lost. Yes, at the ashram. Yes. Well, there are numerous verses in every category that say practically the same thing. Yes. So even if we don't cover like every single verse, yes. we can still get the gist of yes. what Ramana's teaching is all about. Yes. And I like it that they say it many times because this uh, raises the odds for me that this stupid mind will catch on if I <laughs> keep hearing it. My Adi Guru's guru used to say, you have to beat the mind in the morning with a stick <laughs> and in the evening with a shoe. <laughs> yeah, because it won't take up discipline on its own. Uh-huh. That's right. You have That's to use the intelligence. Yes. Use your intelligence to put the mind in its place. Right. That's the whole basis, I think, of practice. You know, that's exactly what you're doing. And You're saying to the mind, neti, neti. That's right. Except for me, I can't say uh, not this, not this, just quickly. Uh, to make it soak in, I have to dwell on it enough to where, you know, somehow this is feeling, not some idea. Right. And when I get to that point, then I can start to let it go. Until then, letting go of one idea with another idea still doesn't get there. It's that the scriptures give the example of using a thorn to pull yes. out another thorn. Yes. But then you're still left with a thorn, right? <laughs> but if you go deeply into each idea and, you know, you really see how it's not real, it's not yes. that, you know? Yes. It's not this, the self, or that the world, you know, Saguna or Nirguna Brahman. Yes. All right. Chuck it. Not worth keeping around. Yes. So the bottom line in all of this is that over the last three and a half years or so, I deliberately went into karma and bhakti yoga because I wanted to give the audience, the viewers, 
something they could grasp mm -hmm. more easily than Ramana's teaching, which could be so abstruse and difficult. Yes, yes. Uh, so now I feel like I don't have any more time to do that. And I want to kind of cut to the chase, you know? Good. Get to the real essence of the full teaching. Now that we know what the full teaching is, the four right. yogas, yes. then it makes sense that you can't just jump up to the ajatta platform mm -hmm. artificially or yes. even the vivarta platform. Mm -hmm. You have to go through the basics. You have to master the fundamentals. You have to clean up your act enough to where you're capable to qualify. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, didn't we go over a couple of weeks ago the six qualities? Yes. Sama, Dhamma, Titikshva, Karunika, and, and so on. <laughs> Titikaksha and uh, whatever the meditation. Dhyana. Was the sixth, yes. Yeah. So um, without those qualifications, if one externally imitates meditation, it's useless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, before the, and before those six, there still was discrimination, being able to they, tell the real from the unreal, which is a big deal, especially to get started, and then uh, detachment. And yeah. Nomi said of detachment that detachment is easy when you know the real source of happiness. Which yes, is but within. When, when you don't know that, it feels like painful, you know? That's right. Oh, right. I, I can't do this, I can't do that, you know? <laughs> yes, I have to give up something that I like. Nami said, you give up something you like in favor of something you love. Oh, that's a really good way to put it. Well, how are we doing on time? I think we're doing fine. Uh, the universe is timeless anyway. <laughs> but I don't want to make these too long, you know. Oh, I know. I, that's bored. right. Otherwise, uh, we need uh, survival by ordeal. <laughs> anyway, listen to, these, listen to these old men, you know, talking to each other about this esoteric <laughs> stuff. That's right. That's right. These old men who both of them are just sitting there smiling. I don't know why they're smiling. Yeah, what have they got to, to smile about? <laughs> well, my beard grew a little longer today. Oh, boy. <laughs> Anyway, very good, and uh, I am uh, grateful that we are to the place where we can talk about this and uh, look at texts that show the deepest teaching. Yeah, it's a real blessing for me because you know how it is to be um, kind of lonely because you know too much? Uh, being the smartest guy in the room is not fun. That's right. So to have somebody else who understands things on the same level is really valuable. Yes. And our offline talks, you know, where we discuss all these things just person to person, mano a mano, are really valuable. Yes, for me as well. And I have uh, shared the loneliness of which you speak with you in my own life. And in some ways, that was a blessing because it uh, demonstrated how basically I needed to, within myself, find out what was going on. You know, since those other guys wouldn't talk to me. Right. 
And to be free from distraction enables you to listen deeply yes. to your own voice. Yes. And it's hard when you get started to listen to your own voice because there's all this other noise from the mind. Yeah, but, what does so-and-so think of me and what are they going that's to do? Right, blah, that's blah, blah. right. But uh, the voice goes away. If and you ignore it long enough. That's right. And what's there then is the question. I think that is the heart of self-inquiry. There what are no others. That's right. What remains when you take away everything? There's still something there. The self? Yes. <laughs> no oh, that's that. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Ramanaya. Sri Ramanaya.